Um, so thank you very much for attending this lecture. As I said, so today we'll do our hospitality economics course. We'll do uh, the entire uh, content of the course. So we will not do uh, as, if, as, we, as we did for TIFA and for statistics, for example, uh, although we did a midterm presentation, but we decided since probably no one has really started uh, with preparation for this exam, yeah. that would be the best to just do the entire uh, content. So we'll do cha chapters 1 to 14. To 14. So uh, we, we split again. We decided to split this session in two parts. So first, Cecilia will take you through the theoretical concepts of the course. Uh, so we'll present all theoretical chapters and then I will do all case studies. Um, as Michelle said, you can always find recording of this session on YouTube. Uh, you can find the PowerPoint on um, our website and you can follow us on Instagram to receive the updates of the content and uh, just gener general Update. So also let me remind you that today at 5.30 there will be a recap session of uh, service quality and design, uh, which will be fully online. Um, so yeah, feel free, you are like uh, invited to attend this uh, lesson as well. So yeah, let's start then um, and I will leave the stage to Cecilia. Hello everyone, um, I'm Cecilia, if you guys didn't know me. Um, so we're going to start with some theory recap, just letting you know there's numbers at the beginning of each chapter, but they're not correlated with the lesson we saw them just because we're doing first all the theory and then all of the recap. So we wouldn't all of like the case studies, so it wouldn't get confusing. So let's start it. So if you remember the first lesson, it was all about introduction to um, hospitality economics, a little recap of microeconomics. So first, we're just going to have some characteristics of the making of modern tourism. So first is that tourists were temperance activists and they were small in numbers and thus insufficient to intense suppliers. However, due to historical implications, a prelude to modern tourism, travel activities were commercialized and institutionalized and that's when we had more like a boom when we started more tourism. Um, so as an outcome in 1851, 1,000, oh, sorry. <laughs> 150,000 visitors to attend the Great Exhibition in London. And then during the 1872 to 1873, the first round of the world tour lasted 222 days and 29 miles. Now you don't have to know this details in particular, but it's just good to have a little context of how after this historic implication, traveling started becoming more permanent. Uh, so of course you all remember Thomas Cook, he was mentioned a lot. So he practiced econ economies of scale in his tour operating business. So he worked kind of like a tour guide trying to get more tourism across England. Um, the major cost of each train trip, because that's what they were traveling back in the day, was the coaling and the steaming up. So the idea was to pack up with people and then see no reason why a hundred may not travel together because it's the same as the dozen. So he was just trying to start economies of scale so more people could travel for the same cost as one person would. So this was the cost advantage he was focusing on. So now we're going to talk a little bit about tourism versus hospitality because a lot of people tend to mix the terms because they are, of course, intertwined. But so first we talk a little about traveling. So the definition of traveling is to go from one place to another, typically over a distance of some length. So most people would just say that traveling would be OK. So it can be just me going from here to BDS on lots particularly because um, travel is more than just going from A to B. It should also help you achieve success. So if you have a job interview in New York and you take a plane to go there, then that's you would be traveling because it's helping you achieve a particular success. Then we have tourism, whereas it comprises the activities of persons traveling to and staying in places outside their usual environment for not more than one consecutive year for leisure. Yet if you're moving for more than one year for leisure, then this wouldn't be considered tourism. It would be considered a momentary like move. Um, and then it has to be for leisure business or other purposes and not related to the exercise of an activity remunerated from within the place visited. So if you're going again, let's say you're going to London for a business meeting, of course, you're getting paid by your company but none of the activities you're doing in London were going to be remunerated there itself. You know, so yes, you can have business traveling that that also accounts into tourism, but you're not traveling with the main purpose of purpose of making money there. And then moving on, we have hospitality, which is present when something happens for you and it's the absence of when something happens to you. So this definition may seem a little bit bizarre, but if you think about it, tourism is traveling, but when it's made easier for you, 
with the hospitality aspect of trying to help you, you know, and it's when they're helping you, you don't really necessarily like notice it extravagantly, but it's something happening to you instead of like for you instead of to you. And so these two propositions for and to express it all, and it's important for you guys to remember it. Um, so basically travel, tourism and hospitality related sectors are fragmented into functionalities and they're dynamic. The tourism industry cannot be sustained on the supply side because tourism supplies a combination of a wide range of sectors, primarily hotels, airlines, restaurants, and so on. So tourism supply is not itself individually, it's made up a lot of different things. And hospitality can be independent of recreational travel and mass tourism. Because of course, if you're not necessarily traveling anywhere, you can have hospitality in a restaurant where in your hometown, so they're not necessarily correlated, but they go hand in hand. So now, let's go into the breadth and depth of tourism and hospitality. Now, this is very important to remember because when you're looking at this, you might be asked to place a specific firm or a company or a person into one of these sectors and you need to understand, right? So the breadth is kind of like the different segments that you will have, right? So it's more focused on the side of the supply. So you have all of these different companies that are related to hospitality and tourism, like hotels, restaurants, airlines, as well as non-hospitality infrastructures. Because of course, when people are traveling to a new place, um, they might spend money at a store, they might go shopping, so they're still making some money there. So it's still correlated to the supply of things correlated with tourism. Then when you're moving on into the depth, getting more deep into not just the supply of tourism, then you go through intermediaries, which would be tour operators or travel agencies, that they're basically, their main job is to connect the supply to the demand. And again, the demand will always be the tourist, the consumer, the guest. So there were some structural changes in the breadth dimension as tra um, air travel supplemented railways in the 1960s, which made people be able to travel more for greater distances and greater periods of time. Um, there were also a lot of seaside tours via train that replaced um, Mediterranean vacations, as well as accommodation sharing businesses around 2008. And then some of the structural changes on the depth dimension this way. Um, it would be the business model of package tours produces costs with the help of intermediaries. Um, we had global distribution systems, online travel agencies, as well as sharing economy enterprises in 2010. So I'm sure you guys are all familiar with OTAs and GDSs because we learned about it a lot at school. <laughs> so it's very important in order to understand hospitality economics to determine who is the tourist. But this was help determine the demand, right? So you have to think back into the definition that I gave you before, right? It has to involve distance. It has to be in an unusual environment, not where you live. Um, and it is stated that international tourism, then you have to be from a different country, but they will have to make the specification. If not, you can just consider it all to be a distance. Um, as well as time, because it has to be temporarily less than a year. If it's more than a year, then it doesn't count. As well as non-remuneration, no money can be paid for work or services. As again, as I've said, business travelers are still tourists, even if they make money because their earnings are not necessarily related to that destination. And any person traveling that meet these requirements are considered tourists. And tourism has little to do with the purpose of the trip and just more this specific criteria that you have to meet. Now, how to measure tourism activity? Well, it's hard to quantify how much a tourist spend. There are a few indicators we can use to try to get like a ballpark idea of how much they're spending on their trip. So first we have tourist arrivals, right? So this is the number of tourists multiplied by the trips that the tourist makes in a given time period. So the more a, tur a tourist travels to that specific um, destination, the more they will spend there. So let's say if you're doing a business travel, you have to go, um, I don't know, three times a month to London to make a business. Well, they're going to be able to say number of tourists. So one person coming from Geneva and they're going to three different times. So then they can multiply by three and kind of get a better idea of how much that person would be spending. And then they make like an average to get um, like a quantity. Then they also look into the length of stay. So the longer the stay, the higher the expenditure. Of course, if you're staying at a hotel, simply the more nights you spend, the more money you spend. So they kind of go hand in hand. Um, and tourist expenditure. Now this is the most important one. That's why it has a little asterisk. Um, and this is how much money they spend at a destination. Now, usually the hospitality and travel sectors are the most benefited, but they can spend money in other sectors. If you have to go to the hospital because you got sick, well, then that would be going to another sector, but still coming from tourism. Um, so the most important is because there is a direct relationship with GDP. Because this, if you know GDP, gross domestic product, learn about macroeconomics. If you have any questions about it, I hope you don't because you already had that exam, but you can let me know. Um, and yeah. So now. Some facts and figures about tourism and the world economy. Again, this is not specific figures that you have to remember or anything, but it's more to give an introduction into all the things we learned throughout the semester. So there are direct, indirect, and induced effects to tourism. 
most of the contributions from tourism actually come from the induced and indirect effect. So a direct effect would be the changes in economic activity that will affect the expenditure of tourism immediately. And there have to be receipts. There has to be proof of people coming from the airport, something to prove that it's directly related to that. Then we have indirect effects. So this was already changes from sale, employment, or income that happens within the backward link industry. So any industries that supply products and services to the hotel. Let's say um, the vegetable producers who supply the hotel, well, this would be part of the indirect effect because yes, you're supplying the tourists directly, but through the hotel. So that's why it would be con um, conducted like that. And then there's induced, which is any changes that happen in the economic activity resulting from household spending on income that are earned directly or indirectly as a result of tourism spending. So the total economic impact of tourism is the sum of adding the direct, indirect, and induced effects. Again, induced is for, let's say someone that works at a hotel, a receptionist, they'll make their salary and then they'll go and spend it somewhere else. So then that's induced. That's why the majority of the impact of tourism in the world economy has to do with the induced and indirect effects. Moving on, contributions to GDP. Again, gross domestic product is just accumulation of how much money is earned in one country. So uh, specifically for SIDs, which is small islands or developing states, tourism tends to make up around 30 and 80 percent of GDP. They rely heavily on tourism and some examples are like the Pacific Islands, the Caribbean, which if you've ever been to the Caribbean or any of the Pacific Islands um, out in Asia, you know that most of their GDP is going to be composed of tourism because that's their main source of income for the country as a whole. Um, then we have developed countries OEC. So this one, the total contribution is represented in a percentage and relatively tourism makes a very little contribution to OECD um, countries economy because the percentage tends to be less than 2%. But if you're doing 2% of a billion, then it's still going to be a very significant amount contributed to the economy. Um, this is usually true for most developed countries with some exceptions like Spain, Portugal and Mexico, where tourism is still a very predominant and contribution to the economy. Um, of course, we know the size of GDP of OECD countries is larger, that's a small percentage, so it makes a big difference, as I said before. And now we're moving on to the next lesson we had, which is more into economic thinking and kind of tying back the concept of learning macroeconomics back in box one. So first, I hope you'll remember the demand and supply curves and how they intersect at equilibrium. This means that whatever um, quantity and price produced at that point will maximize the profits, and that means that both the supplier and the buyer will be happy with this outcome. Um, so that's the optimal price and quantity. And then you can have shifts on any curve, which will then, of course, change the point of equilibrium. If you have a shift in demand and it goes to the left, well, then you know uh, price will increase and then quantity will decrease accordingly. Um, of course, you must remember the demand equations. The, we tend to look at them as linear functions just to simplify it. So the inverse demand function, which is used a lot, is usually P equals MQ plus B or the standard demand function is Q equals negative P plus B over X. Both equations are mathematically equivalent, but they're economically different. I don't know this because whenever we're trying to find marginal revenue, we know we have to set it equal to P, so then we can multiply the Q. So it's just different things that happens, but of course the result will be the same because they're mathematically equivalent. So moving on to market efficiency. And again, this is a topic that's very important remembering for um, consumer surplus and producer surplus because it's connected to some of the latest topics we did um, towards the end of the semester. So first, consumer surplus is whenever the consumer's willingness to purchase, that's what WTP stands for, you'll see that abbreviation a lot. Um, and that happens when the willingness to pay is higher than the price. So the difference between the willingness to pay and the price is equal to the consumer surplus. So P1 minus P0, if you look at it here, it's a little purple square, um, triangle, sorry. <laughs> and that will be the consumer surplus. Then we have the producer surplus, which is basically the same thing, but looking at it from the supplier's point of view. Um, and so here it's when the supplier's willingness to supply is lower than the price. And again, the difference would be um, P0 minus P2. Now moving on, we have a thing called social surplus. Now social surplus is the addition of consumer surplus and producer surplus. Of course, when... Um, if social surplus increase, then the, the market is more efficient. It, when social surplus is maximized, then that means that the market is perfectly efficient and there's no dead weight loss, which we'll see in the next slide. Um, in free markets, market efficiency is undermined. Then that's when P0 and Q0 are in equilibrium, and that means that social surplus is maximized. So if the market, the market is not efficient, when P0 is not in equilibrium. Now, price controls. We have two different types of price controls that we focused on, floors and ceilings. 
counterintuitively, the price floor is on top and the price ceiling is on the bottom. But basically what you have to remember is that the ceiling sets a control that sets a maximum. So you cannot go higher than this price, right? So this is the ceiling. You cannot go further that point. So um, the, here it will be that P1 is smaller than P0. So again, the price set for the ceiling is going to be lower than the price at equilibrium. And the demand is too high, so we have a shortage in supply. Again, there's no incentives to provide um, the quantity at equilibrium because suppliers will provide quantity one respective to um, price one. This creates a shortage, and of course, social surplus is not maximized here, so it's an inefficient model. At the same time, we have floors, which is a control sets a minimum. So let's say if you're standing up on top of it, you cannot go lower than that. That's the minimum price you have to reach. Um, and so here, price two is greater than price zero. So um, here, the demand on the employer, it would be on the employer side, right? So we have a shortage in demand, but excess or a surplus in supply. Basically, this creates unemployment because you have more, less people wanting to hire and a lot more people wanting to be hired and work. Um, then we have to remember the unemployment rate just in case they ask you this because it was one of the questions on the midterm, if I'm not mistaken. So unemployment rate also presented as capital letter R is equal to the number of people unemployed over the number of, number of people looking for jobs. So the number of people unemployed is equal to Q2 minus Q1 and then the number of labor force is the whole range, right? So it would be Q1 to Q1 um, to Q2. So in the end, R would be equal to Q2 minus Q1 over Q2. So it's a very simple equation. You just have to remember, you're just trying to find the area in between. And then we have the dead weight loss, which I mentioned before. So that's this little triangle here in blue that you can see on the screen. Um, and that's the area between demand and supply bounded by Q1 and Q0. And it's the <laughs> cost to society created by market inefficiencies, right? And this occurs when supply and demand are out of equilibrium, so of course, when social surplus is maximized, we wouldn't have a little triangle because everybody would be happy and the market would work at the best efficiency. Now, moving on, we saw different factors that affect um, the supply and demand in hospitality economics. And there are push and pull factors, right? So pull factors attract tourists to the destination. So these are basically related to the supply, right? So price level, supply abundance, infrastructure, destination attractiveness, or any other concepts they're pulling people to come, right? So the example we saw in class is Dubai, and we'll go uh, more in depth to it later on, but basically when you change your infrastructure and become more attractive, more people are gonna come, so you're pulling the demand to come to you. Now, at the same time we have on the demand side, push factors, right? So let's say that there's more disposable income, there's more time available, people come of age and they can travel alone, all these different, um, sorry, I forgot the word. All these different factors will contribute to people wanting to travel more. So they're kind of pushing them out to travel. And that's the example he gave in class with outbound tourism in China, because more people were having um, more disposable income, so they were traveling more. So this makes up the push and pull framework, and it shows the changes in the demand and supply curves and how those factors can um, cause a change in equilibrium. Again, demand curve determined by push factors. If a push factor changes like income, then the demand shifts. Positive effects shift to the right, negative effects shift to the left, and then we have a new equilibrium point. Then if you're looking for the supply curve, um, this is determined by pull factor. So if the pull factors change, for example, there's more restaurants, the supply for hotel increases, then you have positive effects shift to the right, negative effects shift to the right, and again, a new equilibrium point. So I know this is very um, basic information that most of you guys might have an idea, but again, it's just a refreshment so everybody feels confident for the final. Um, so then moving on, we looked at some of the growth models which was demand drives supply and supply creates demand. So this is goes directly correlated with the push and pull framework. So in demand drive supply, demand changes first, and then we have a positive shift in demand, which will cause a shift in the supply as a result, right? So for example, Q will increase from both changes as the market expands. However, price is harder to judge. So it's important to remember that if an increase in supply is greater than the increase in demand, then price will be lower. But if the increase in supply is smaller than the increase in demand, the price will be higher. Now, if the increase in supply is exactly the same as the increase in demand, then price will remain unchanged. Okay? Then, looking at it from supply creates demand. Well, that's the other way around, right? Supply changes first, and then demand follows. So, any positive shift in supply, demand increases due to the increase in supply, and Q will increase from both changes as the market expands. Once again, price is a little bit harder to judge, um, but it's exactly the same thing that happens in the supply side. So, price will always have the same effect. It just depends on the type of change. Now, moving on to the next um, chapter we saw, we had net for network effects in market demand. Now, usually you have individual demand versus market demand. So a situation in which an individual's demand for good is influenced by the number of other consumers. 
So here we're going to have to think about network externalities, right? So if a network externality is positive, um, the quantity of a good demanded by a consumer increases due to the growth in purchases of other consumers. If it's negative, the quantity of a good demanded by a consumer decreases due to the growth in purchases of other consumers. Now, um, network effects are such as interpersonal effects, neighborhood effects, and your behavior is affected by your neighbors, right? So the demand in the presence of network externalities affects it. And there's three main effects that we saw, if you guys remember them from the midterm, are the bandwagon, the snob, and the villain effect, which will go more into depth. But basically, they're just network externalities because there are different changes that are not related to the market itself for a change in price or quantity, but it will still have an effect in demand. Now, the bandwagon effect. This is the first one, and it's kind of easy to understand because everybody knows the term bandwagon when someone discovers a new band and then everybody starts liking it. It's kind of like the same thing, but applied to economics. Um, so here, demand increases as others are purchasing a product. So it's kind of like following in the trend. Um, so the increase in demand leads to an even greater increase in demand because more people are just following. It's kind of like a snowball effect that just keeps going. Um, we can see that the bandwagon effect comes into effect when a consumer base increases from Q0 to Q1. Right there. Um, and as a product becomes more fashionable, the demand increases. So we have a new demand curve, D1, which is a shift. And the shift has nothing to do with the price, but with the consumer base because it's an external. Um, Thing, right so then the new line between a and c connects the initial and the final points and that becomes the new demand curve for the bandwagon product so again this line between a and c will be the new demand using the effect um so now things to consider when you're calculating the elasticities for when the um, graph considers or not the effect that we have we have um ac so in this case it would be d because it's the demand for bandwagon um the curve is more elastic than the original curve um, because with a bandwagon effect, then without all of the things being equal. And then we have some changes from P0 to P1. So the change with the effect, you will calculate it doing Q2 minus Q1 without the effect Q1 minus Q0. And this is also called the pure price effect. So if someone asks about the pure price effect, it's the same thing as without the effect. And then the total price effect is Q2 minus Q0. So any increases from Q0 to Q2 because of the effect. And then the total price um, effect would be pure price effect plus one bag bandwagon effect. And you can use those formulas interchangeably to try to figure out one or the other. In case you're asked to calculate um, the pure price effect, well, then you're going to know you can use the total price effect and then you just use the bandwagon effect given and so on. Now, the snob effect. This one also kind of sounds similar because, you know, people that are very snobby that they want to have things that are unique. You don't want to be compared to other people and they can feel like they're kind of on a high horse. So here, demand actually decreases as more people are buying the products. Again, this the aspect is all about uniqueness. Um, the person in question searches for exclusivity, and if everyone has it, then it kind of loses the appeal for them. And as I mentioned before, some of the keywords are unique and exclusive. Um, again, D0 works as a benchmark and the decrease in price from P0 to P1 causes a movement um, along the curve that increases the quantity demanded. So the original curve shifts to the left, which is a contraction becoming D1, and then this would still be a downward slope due to the law of demand. However, you can see that there was a decrease because of the externality effect. Um, once again, when you're looking at the elasticity for the snow effect, you can look at the formulas, but they're pretty much the same case scenario as it was for the previous effect. So let's just move on because we have a lot of topics to cover and it's going to be a very long day. Now, the Veblen effect. This one would be a little bit more complicated because it goes against the law of demand, which means the slope is going to be positive and going up. Um, the demand increases as the price of a product rises. So the increase in price leads to an increase in demand. This is inconsistent with the law of demand, as I said before, and it's kind of similar to the snob effect, but um, the difference is that it does not matter who is buying it or not. It's caused either by the belief that the higher price means higher quality or the desire for conspicuous consumption. Um, so yeah, the benchmark once when P0 increases to P1 and then Q0 decreases to Q1 and we have a shift to the right in the demand curve because the change um, from P0 to P1 actually creates an increase in demand instead of a decrease. Once again, if you want to know what the um, elasticity is, you know that the change with effect is Q2.
variable cost. Um, the following are derived from the two basic cost concepts. So you're all familiar with the average total cost, total cost divided by Q, or if um, average fixed cost plus average variable cost. Again, these are all formulas that should be very familiar to you. They're in the slides if you want to have them um, in handy. But once again, um, it's just dividing the specific cost by the quantity. And then the marginal cost will just be the derivative of the cost function or the changes in variable cost over the changes in quantity. Again, it doesn't concern the fixed cost because when you're taking the marginal fixed cost will come up as a constant. And you know that whenever you're driving constants are not taken into consideration. Now, we're going to look into a little bit of more complex cost structures in hospitality. It's important to um, understand the supply in the hospitality industry through a cost perspective. Complex cost structures in hospitality businesses take into account capital versus labor. So capital investments in various sectors, such as airlines, cruise ships, and theme parks. And this is any initial investment that you have to do in order to get your business going. And then labor costs usually escalate in the hotel industry because they're correlated with your operating expenses. And labor costs tends to be a very significant portion of the hotel industry. So this is just some connection into hospitality because it's hospitality economics. Um, now, when it comes to hotel and um, cost performance analysis, it's important to look into the demand, supply, and the hotel performance. So the metrics of performance in the hotel industry include supply, demand, and revenue. So the number of rooms available, number of rooms sold, and then the revenue generated from the room sales. Again, revenue, it would be equal to ADR times the rooms they sold. Some of the key performance indicators, we've known them all, we've seen it many times, so occupancy percentage, ADR, and REFPAR tend to be the most significant. Um, and then when we move into revenue, cost, and profit, we have short run versus long run. So the key difference, again, is the change in fixed cost this fixed cost cannot change in the short run. It's very hard to change the number of rooms you have in a hotel, but in the long run, then yes, you can adapt it based on any structural changes. Um, it's important to understand the three functions. So the revenue function, which is again, price times quantity. Uh, and then, you know, price in this case would be ADR and quantity would be the occupancy in case you use those terms, then you know which one would be which. Um, the cost function, which is, as I said before, fixed cost plus variable cost times the quantity because it depends on the problem and the profit function will just be the total revenue minus the total cost. Optimization of short run operation. The key to optimization is marginal revenue equals marginal cost. We've seen that plenty of times before. So whenever P crosses a marginal cost, which is this line, only takes into account um, variable costs as I said before. Any change in supply is difficult. However, in the long run it's possible, but short run is it. So it's important to optimize as much as you can, setting just your marginal revenue equals your marginal cost. Um, and yeah, so for example, if you're given three hotels that have the same variable cost but different price points, what can win fair? The higher the price, the greater the quantity produced, because the only thing taken into account will be their marginal costs or the variable cost. And if they have the same ones, well, then there's really not going to be any other change but the price that they're charging you. So it's just very intuitive. So even if you're ever asked a question and you're not sure, I would recommend getting post-its or a notebook or something next to you, drawing it out and kind of see what effect happens and you should be able to figure basically anything out. Um, then we're moving on to market boundaries. So there's different types of ways that companies can set boundaries into their products in order to differentiate themselves. So first we're gonna look into boundary by product. So here, let's say tourism offers a variety of products and services provided by firms in all sorts of sectors that are more or less related to tourism, hospitality, and travel. Now, even if you focus on one sector like hotels, there are many substitutes for this product which makes it harder for hotels to maintain or exercise their market power. Again, every firm wants to have a high market power because that means that they're gonna be more profitable in the long run. Uh, for some products, while it's very clear if they operate on different markets, such as airlines and hotels, right? There's a clear boundary. You cannot really compare a hotel with an airplane because they provide different things for you and they serve different purposes. But it becomes less clear when you're focusing on products that are similar, such as airlines and railways. Yes, they both provide transportation, but they're not the same. However, it all depends on how you set the boundary and to where you're going to have the difference in order to differentiate and set who's going to have the greater market power in the market. Um, so then it's crucial to determine your boundaries because the market power of a firm diminishes if the boundary of the market is extended. Well, it would increase if the boundary was narrowed down. Everyone knows it, you know, if it's a very big boundary, well, then you're going to have a lot more substitutes and you're going to decrease your market power. Whereas if it's the other way around, then you're going to have a larger portion of the pie for yourself. Um, however, this doesn't mean that we can classify the markets as we wish. It depends on the extent to which the demand for and the supply of two or more products can be substituted. So it's not like any hotel can decide, okay, this is going to be my boundary. It kind of has some rules to go by. Now, look at boundary by location. 
This is where the ge geographic boundary of the market comes into place. The extent to which firms in different locations can affect market power has to do with location of the operating, the operation or business. So any firms in different locations can obtain market power, even if they have the exact same product. So for example, in tourism and hospitality, the market boundaries are not limited on the product dimension, but how far um, away one business is from another. So if two firms are far apart, they will have no effect on each other. Um, they're not in the same location, thus we see a geographic boundary. For example, a casino in Las Vegas is not going to interfere whatsoever with a casino in Macau. You know, they're completely different places and why they're all, they're all offering you gambling, fun and drinks and everything you want. Different places, not going to affect their market um, share. So their market power will stay the same. Now, measuring market concentration. This is important because once again, it's all related. This has to do with the concentration and again, the market power that each firm is going to have in that particular market. So. We have two different ways in which we calculated market concentration, CR and HHI. So first let's focus on CR. Here is whenever you're adding the market shares of a certain number of the largest firms. So usually whatever number goes after the CR will determine which, how many of the largest firms you're going to actually add up in order to get the concentration ratio. So usually it's the four largest, but they can write six, eight, however many they want. So you can apply the same idea, just add the number of firms according to the little number next to the CR. Um, and again, the formula would be CR4 is equal to the sum of the market shares of the four largest firms. So you take the market shares, as I said before, of however many largest players, and then you add them up. Literally, just take however many largest market shares you have and do a simple addition. And then you should get the, the amount of power that those four firms control in the market. So let's say four firms make up 60%, well, then you know that every other firm after that will only have to divide the extra 40% that's available in the market because it's only going to be 100%. We cannot just have 120% of the market. Um, so yeah, and also you must remember that whichever one is the most concentrated, it's also going to be the least competitive. And whichever one's the least concentrated is going to be the most competitive. So again, most concentrated would be perfect competition, less competitive because no, sorry, it would be monopolies, the most concentrated because there's no competitors. So they literally have 100% of the market share in that specific like industry. However, the least concentrated, such as perfect competition, it would be the most competitive because again, there's no barriers of entry or exit. So anybody can come as they please. And you know, there's gonna be a lot more competition. And so it's most likely that you're gonna have a smaller market share because there's a lot more people going in. So moving on to the HHI, it actually has a very long name, like the Henderson Hall Index. You don't have to remember that. Just remember that it's HHI and it's the alternative measure. And then this one, you look into the number and the size distribution of firms in an industry. So you would do the sum of the market shares of each firm squared for the largest 50 firms. If it's more than six, if it's more than 50, don't worry. You just have to do for the first 50 firms. But for the exam, they won't give you more than 20 because it would just take ages and it would be cruel. So I'm pretty <laughs> sure the teacher wouldn't do it. Um, so we're going to get rid of the percentage sign to make it easier. And we're always going to take the absolute value in order to do this. Also, we're squaring it. So that's why we're taking the absolute value. Um, adding the square to the market share. So the market share of one to the power of two plus the market share of two to the power of two times, et cetera, until you get to 50. And you should be able to see the concentration firm for each of them. So the large firm numbers dilute market concentration. The more firms, the less concentrated. Pretty simple, as I said before. Now, it's not switching. Okay. okay. So we have the Lorenz curve for market concentration. We've all heard the Lorenz curve before, but it's kind of like this old name we've heard a bunch of years ago, and then we don't remember exactly where it is. Well, here it's we use it in order to see the concentration of a company in a specific market. So in order to plot it, you're going to need to understand first that in an industry, how many numbers of firms we have is going to be n, right? So that's the number we're going to use for our equations. Then the size distribution, so the market share of each firm in the industry. We classify the large firms, so the big market shares, versus the small firms or the low market shares. We're going to plot them on the largest to smallest from left to right, as you can see there. And that's why it starts from the bottom and starts curving up. Um, so the x-axis is the number of firms as a percentage. And it's accumulated share of firm numbers from largest in percentage. So you're going to do the rank. So let's say you have the number one company. So you're going to take that rank divided by the number of firms times 100, and that should be the plot that you're going to put. And then on the y-axis, you're going to be you're going to be comparing it to the accumulated market share. 
So the second point in YX is going to be the sum of the largest and the second largest. So let's say the first um, firm had 10% and the second one had five. Well, then you're going to plot it at 15 because you're going to keep adding it up so it goes further up. So you know, um, for the Y, you do cumulative and same thing for the X. Um, once you plot all of your points, you connect them using a line and that's how you get the Lorentz curve and it goes like that. Usually it's always um, like a little hump going towards the diagonal to the left and we have the perfect equality line at 45 degrees. So your Lorentz curve will never be under that perfect equality line. So if you see that it happened, then you probably did something wrong or you should recalculate. Um, once you plot all of your points and you connect them, if the size distribution is even than the curve, it will be a straight 45 degree line and that's the least concentrated market. So the perfect equality line, it would be the example for perfect competition. And if you look at this line that goes diagonally to the top like that, well, that would be the Lorentz curve for monopolies because it means that they're the most concentrated. But they usually look like the Lorentz curve in the middle. Now, demand supply, sustainability, and market power. So demand sustainability and market power measures the degree to which consumers can substitute a product in one market for another in a different market and vice versa. So if the demand substitutability is slow, it means that there's a clear boundary in the industry and the market is more concentrated, so least competitive. Basically, it's thinking demand substitutability. If you can easily change one product for another, then it's probably going to have a high substitutability. Whereas if it has a lower one, then you don't face that problem. And that has to do with the boundaries that we have mentioned before. Stronger barriers, more market share for the company, it's competitive. Now, looking at it from the supply side, um, supply substitutability affects market concentration as well. So if the supply substitutability is high, markets tend to merge into the same market. So if you have the same share and there's not a clear boundary for um, luxury and upper upscale, then they're kind of going to mesh together for the supply side of that portion. So if the supply substitutability is slow, then there tends to be clear boundaries within the markets and then markets tend to be more concentrated. So in conclusion, the higher the substitutability for two products, the more blurry the market boundary gets as it kind of merges together, and so the lower the concentration for a firm. While on the other side, um, the higher, the lower the substitutability, the more clear the market boundary is, with a clearer divide, and the higher the concentration. Now, moving on to price discrimination versus uniform pricing. Now, this was the last topic we saw before the midterm, so we're almost getting to the new stuff. So just hold on with me. Um, so we're going to look into uniform prices off of monopolies. So price will be set in two steps. First, they will take the optimal quantity where marginal revenue equals the marginal cost. Secondly, they will take um, the appropriate price based on quantity. It's called uniform pricing because if we're looking at just one consumer and they buy something for 10 people, then if they buy two of those, it will be 20. So the price stays the same. It's going to be uniform regardless of the amount of products you're going to get. You're not going to get a discount if you buy in bulk. You know, it doesn't work like that. It's uniform pricing, everything's the same, and you just got to deal with it. Then we're moving on into price discrimination. Now, discrimination may sound ugly because it's not the best of words, but it really just means that they're going to change the prices into different aspects in order to offer different price ranges for different people that have different needs. So um, price discrimination is defined as the opposite from uniform pricing. And it says they use different prices. So monopolies have two ways of pricing their products and everybody else doesn't really. They kind of choose it, right? So price discrimination has two approaches. First, a firm changes different prices to different consumers for reasons other than the difference in cost. And the second is that a firm charges different prices for the, to the same consumer for different units for reasons other than differences in cost. Again, if the difference, if they're charging you higher is because it's a more expensive product, well, then it has nothing to do with price discrimination and all to do with the equation that it still has to be profitable for the company. So there's three types of price discrimination we saw. First degree, second degree, and third degree. So third degree is a charge with different prices to consumer segments. It's the easiest to implement, and you're basically just focusing, focusing on the segment. Then you have second degree um, discrimination, which is wherever you're charging different prices for blocks or sales. So if you're charging, I don't know, you say, okay, buy 10 and you get 15. Well, that would be an example of second degree because you're getting more for the price you're paying. And then first degree, this is wherever you're charging an individual consumer a different price. Now. Um, the, this is going to be the hardest one to accomplish because it's. Is it, uh, sorry, no, no. We just asking if you could slow the pace for the last uh, like uh, three to four chapters. I think it is. Yeah, for the new stuff I am, but because it's just, it's not as it's going to be very. Long. It's just yeah, you just text it in the in the, in the chat. Right? Yeah, so uh, if if something's unclear, you can also watch recording. But as you see, Cecilia is on fire today. So. <laughs> sorry, I'm just trying to get the chapters we've already seen done, so then we can really spend more time Absolutely. with the new stuff. I agree with that. I agree. Yeah. But I will slow down 100%. I'm Mexican, I talk really fast, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so we're saying that first degree is the hardest one to implement because basically you have to think about it like this. 
there's no way that a company is going to know which price each individual is going to want. So it's the yeah. hardest one to implement. But if you're thinking, OK, but what is a degree? It means that firms acquire information about consumer degree. Um, why is it possible that the same product is priced differently? Well, on the demand side, you're going to look at the consumer's willingness to pay. And that can vary for the same product. For example, person A may be willing to pay X for the same product, while person B might be willing to pay less. It's the same thing. If you ask someone how much would you pay for a T-shirt, someone might tell you $5, someone might tell you $50. It all depends on the person and their preferences. Now, third degree price discrimination. This is all about segments. And the best example we can give you is airline pricing. So if you book a ticket three months in advance, you're going to be charged an X amount. But if you book the same flight, the same flight on the same class, everything the same, it'll be more expensive if you buy it one month in, before your flight, right? Because the difference in price is related to when you're booking your flight and the booking window, which is a time period between your booking date and your departure date. So that's why a lot of people tend to plan holidays in advance so they can buy their um, airplane tickets at a cheaper rate because, of course, it has to do with the demand. The closer you are to the flight, well, the higher you're going to have to pay to get on it. So there you can see with the booking windows, dollar signs, very easy to see if you're in a rush. Um, so relevant, so airlines can differentiate business from leisure travelers. Of course, leisure travelers, they tend to plan their travels more time in advance. If you're a business, you might have, okay, you know what? You're a lawyer. You have a meeting tomorrow because you're about to put your guy in jail. Okay, well, you're going to get on the play one day tomorrow and you're not going to care the price because it's for your job and you don't have another option. It's kind of a way that an airline can make more money, but it's still going to be fair because those business people can also plan a vacation to Hawaii so they can do with, get their price if they book it in advance. Um, so that's a way in which they can differentiate their customers and the customer's willingness to pay based on their needs. Um, so when the airline recognizes these two segments, they can price discriminate as there are two different demands, D1 and D2, one for leisure and one for business. And the firm will charge and sell whatever amounts allows them to make the higher profit. Now, when you're looking into second degree price discrimination, this is when we're focusing on blocks, right? So certain units of productions would be considered a block. And it has to be at least two, but I would say that a block would be more like three up, right? Because two is still a little bit low, but at least has to be two for the definition to work. And so, for example, the company will lower the price if they want to sell additional products to consumer. That's every time you have a sale, which right now I think there's like sales all over the sun, apparently, but we cannot go because we're in finals. <laughs> but basically they can have like buy one, get one 50% off. Well, that's the thing. You're buying two, so you're going to get the discount. If you just buy one, then you don't get the discount because you're not buying the block. Um, selling a product in one unit by one unit is not second degree price discrimination, for example. Ice cream with a promotion, like, oh yeah, if you buy the hog in that ice cream, it's going to be less expensive if you buy Ben and Jerry's. Well, then, no, that's not the same thing. But if they tell you, buy two Ben and Jerry's ice cream and you get a third one free, well, then, yes, that would be focused on the blocks. Um, this is useful for companies wherever they need to buy a lot of the same. So, buying airline tickets, they can get discount for multiple tickets. Of course, it will depend on the demand curve and the willingness to pay. This kind of goes more in hand with buying in bulk. Yeah. First degree price discrimination, it's individual. This is whenever you're differentiating based on an individual com um, consumer, as I said before, it's very complicated um, because let's say there's 100 consumers in a market and each consumer has a different willingness to pay. You have to know it. How are you supposed to know the willingness to pay of each individual consumer? It's crazy. So if you know each consumer's willingness to pay, you are able to plot the demand curve in the market from lowest willingness to pay should be above the marginal cost because of course you're not going to want to charge someone below your marginal cost because then you're not going to be making a profit and it makes no sense. So you're going to be able to price discriminate and say, okay, let's say Jackie here, she doesn't mind spending $100 for a blazer. I don't know. <laughs> then you can be like, okay, so she's going to go here. She's going to pay this amount. But then you see Alex and she says, no, you know what? I only want to pay 50. Okay, so you would put her on the 50. And you'll plot your line in a way that each consumer's willingness to pay will change it. And that way you can maximize your profits because you're going to still be able to sell to people that only want to pay 10 and to people that want to buy 500. You know, It doesn't matter because each person in the end, it'll balance out. But of course, it has to be above your marginal cost because if not, you're in the negatives and nobody likes that. Um, in this case, you should remember that producer surplus is equal to the social surplus and we have no consumer surplus here. And this means that it makes the market perfectly efficient. Now, I'm going to slow down now because this is the new information we have to really get into our brains for the exam. So we have duopoly and price discrimination. Duopoly is just a type of oligopoly, which it doesn't really make that much of a difference in the terminology. So don't freak out if you see the words. Um, but basically, there's two types of product differentiation, horizontal and vertical. So horizontal price discrimination is whenever two products, A and B, are sold at the same price, 
but and consumers have no consensus on which one is preferred. So this is more relative, right? So some prefer A, where others prefer B. For example, hotel rent. Say you have you're looking into luxury hotels, and you have the Waldorf Astoria and the Ritz Carlton. Well, they might and they're selling at the same price, okay, for the sake of the exercise. Um, well, there are some people that may prefer going to the Waldorf Astoria because they have a personal connection, or others might want to go to the Ritz Carlton because they're a married Bombay member and they get loyal. It doesn't matter. Each person is going to have a different preference, and so there is no consensus on which one is the best, which one is preferred. So think you have to think of variety, right? Lots of options, such as lots of things to choose from. So there's no really a direct preference. However, for the vertical product differentiation, you're focusing on two products that are sold at the exact same price, and all consumers agree that that one's a preferred product. So for example, um, here we have to make absolute. All consumers must prefer A over B or B over A. So if you're looking at hotel classification, right, you might have upper of scale, luxury economy, and there's different classes that one can rank them on the scale of which one they prefer. Now, most people will tell you that, of course, if they're gonna go to a hotel, they're gonna choose a luxury one. Price is the same, it doesn't matter. People will still choose that one because why would you wanna go to economy if it costs you the same going to luxury? So then there's a consensus of which one is the preferred one for all consumers. So again, think you have to hear the quality and agree, right? So whenever you think of horizontal, it's relative, pretty much just on the same plane, you don't know. When you're vertical, you know, one's on top and one's on the bottom. There's a very clear way to remember it, right? So just in horizontal, relative, you can choose. This one might be the same, I might prefer this one. Vertical, someone's gonna be on top. So that's an easy way that I like to remember things um, and it might help you too. Now, connected to the duopoly and price um, product differentiation, we have the hoteling model. Now, the hoteling model can be applied to different aspects of a product but in class, we focus on the differentiation by location, right? So where one um, product is located. So a product can have many attributes when it comes to product differentiation, for example, location. Now, when the locations are different, a customer might choose one over the other based on which one is closer to them or is more convenient. Again, if I'm standing here and I wanna go out the door, if I'm in the middle and I'm not gonna care if I'm gonna go to the right or to the left, but if I'm standing here, then why would it make sense for me to go to the left? Even though they're the exact same door, the exact same thing, you might have a preference based on where you're standing, on the location of the two doors, which can be from A, from B, however you want to see it. So the example sometimes just help you remember things better. So bear with me if you don't like them, but <laughs> oops. So um, the model addresses two main questions, right? So first you have to be given the price, how two firms choose their location. So it's a long run decision. And then given the locations, how two firms set their prices in the short run. Again, because it's very unlikely that a firm is going to likely just change their location from one day to the next. You know, there's an infrastructure, there's a building. You cannot just move locations based on a whim, but you can change the price easier. That's why one is longer and the other one's for the short run. Now, some of the assumptions we need to have in order for the hoteling model to work is that first, consumers are uniformly distributed along the fixed length, which is going to be L, right? And that would be a street. Um, and then that L miles means that any one mile interval, that interval will contain one consumer. If you're two miles, then it could be two consumers. So you just have to be uniformly distributed. Because if you think, okay, yeah, but there's five on the left and one on the right, that's not gonna work. Just think uniformly distributed in order for the hoteling model to work. Um, then each consumer is able to buy and buys one unit of the product. Willingness to pay or what the reservation price are will be. Okay, and then transportation costs you need to take into account, because as I said before, because we're focused on location and convenience and the transportation costs might play a role into the decision. Um, and here would be T per mile. So let's say X miles, you would do T times X in order to find your transportation costs. Um, we must take this into account, very important, don't forget it. And that would be on the demand side. But if you're focusing on the supply side, um, here you're gonna think of duopolis, right? So we're gonna have F1 and F2. F2 stands for firm. It could be business, it could be company, it could be McDonald's, Burger King, like the case study, whatever you want. We're just gonna use F1 and F2 for the explanations. Um, they both sell a product identical in all aspects except for the possible location. Um, both have a constant and identical marginal cost. So the marginal cost of one is equal to the marginal cost of two is equal to the marginal cost in general. Both have a, um, their marginal cost will be the same and it's constant. We assume no production constraints. You cannot take into account that because it's just gonna make the model much more complicated. And they're both gonna charge the same price. So the market price, P1 equals P2 and P0. Those are the initial assumptions, of course, the price and the location will change based on what we're going to see next. So now, 
Location in equilibrium. Neither firm has an incentive to relocate. So, okay, how does this work? First of all, the aim is of each firm to position themselves as close to, as to next to each other to reduce their shared market. So let's say this is your street, right? M would be um, standing at the middle. If F1 locates itself here, well, F2 will want to stand here. So an F2 can take all of this market share and then just share this small little space with F1. If they put themselves on the other side, well, then they're going to split the market share more. I hope you guys could see, I don't know if you could see the screen, but basically if a firm is here, well, then F2 is going to locate right next to the right so they can have this whole portion, right? So they can have a bigger market share. So it's kind of going to be uh, like a yo-yo. One, one changes and then the other one changes and then the other one follows and it's going to be a never-ending game until the point where both of the firms relocate to the middle, down the center here. And that's when each of the firms are going to have 50% of the market share. Because to the left, it's going to be for F1, and to the right, it's going to be for F2. It doesn't really matter there. Um, but this also means that now F1 and F2 are not differentiated at all, because now they're exactly at the same location. There's no more difference. You're kind of back at square one, right? So here's to, and then, so what they're going to do, they're going to focus on changing their price, because they always want to be differentiated so they can get a bigger market share than their competitor. So um, as soon, let's say F1 is going to change the price. Well, as soon as F1 changes the price, F2 will change it accordingly so that they're not going to lose any customers to F1. You always want to be competitive. And again, this goes on and on like a cycle. You know, it's just a never ending role. So you're just going to be constantly competing and adjusting until, um, you know, there's no differentiation, but there's going to be a point where the prices are going to be the same and they're going to be exactly the same as the marginal cost equal right because you cannot go lower than your marginal cost but whenever your price is equal to your marginal cost for both companies once again there's no more differentiation and no company is gonna want to go raise your prices because why would you raise your price and he's gonna take all of your competition and nobody can go below because then you were gonna be in the reds and then your boss is gonna fire you because why the hell would you charge you know less money than it actually cost you to make so it's just very thing that they're kind of competing and then it ends nowhere it's kind of like stagnation right so this is also known as the law of minimum product differentiation. So I know it sounds kind of weird, like the law of minimum, but it's just basically saying that whenever they are both located in the same position and they charge the exact same price, well then the price is going to be equal to marginal cost. There's going to be no profit. They're going to have no more product differentiation. And it's kind of like a flop. You says, why would you do that? You're not making any money. It's just, you know, a tire competition that is leading nowhere. Check me. Yeah, basically. It's kind of stagnating. So the law of minimum product differentiation looks at, at no matter how they relocate or change prices, they will always end up at the center, charging price equals marginal cost and making zero profit. So just being saying the law of minimum product differentiation, it's not even the bare minimum. It's kind of like, what are you doing? It's not even worth it. Get out of here. Um, so firms must differentiate their products because if not, they have no market power, no point. And there has to be a point to a business. Yes. What about if we look at it from like an economic profit point of view and where zero profit is actually good profit because it's opportunity cost is involved. Right. But in this case, they're like the exact same product, the exact same thing. What you're basically saying in the model mm -hmm. is that if the price is equal to your marginal cost, you're literally just getting the same amount in that you're paying out. So it's like, why would you still be in a business that's making you no money? Because of opportunity cost. But in this model, there's no opportunity. Okay, okay. It's, it's a model. It's not perfect. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's kind of like assuming things. Of course, it's not always work in actuality. This is more based on the theory. But it's a very good question that I can ask a teacher because I honestly have no clue why they wouldn't think of the opportunity cost. Sure. But it's kind of saying that they're making zero profit. And the idea is to make the most profit, right? We all want to make money. We all want to make the most that we can of the opportunity. But it's a very smart point to bring up. Thank so you very you much. You always need to set price a little bit above marginal cost. If you want to make a profit, yes, that would be ideal. But in this case, because they're kind of like two siblings fighting that they cannot get along and they cannot find a point of common, well, then they're going to end up both losing, you know? Now, we're going to look at the opposite side, which would be the maximum product differentiation. Now, this is where you want to be because here you can actually make profit. Now, if you look at it at first, you might think, okay, but it's basically the exact same thing because in order for the maximum product differentiation to work, you'd have two companies that are going to have to be on opposite sides of the street, right? So F1 would be located to the left and F2 to the right. So there are two extremely different points. Now, they will still have 50% of the market share, but they're not based on the same location. 
and nobody's going to have an incentive to go to the next place. So and this is like the best case scenario of how they can locate themselves because they're still going to have the same market share, but they're not going to be competing in the exact same location. So it actually gives them some point of differentiation based on location, which is what the modeling concept is all that we're doing, right? So um, they have to be completely on different sides of the street. To figure out the equilibrium prices here, we must look at the consumer surplus and, the, and have an indifferent consumer. So consumer surplus we've seen before, really important concept. And let's say that here you're going to have I. That's your indifferent consumer. He doesn't care going to F1 or F2. He's kind of just like floating in the middle. So that's the point we're going to use this arbitrary consumer in order to plot all of our thousands of different um, graphs that you used and equations. And I just put like the main ones you need to know because I'm not going to go over how to simplify or change X or divide because honestly, I'm not the best in math and it's kind of already done and we're just going to waste time. So um, here, in this case, as you can see, there's a different consumer and the distance between consumer I and firm one is going to be equal to X, right? So that's going to be one portion of the whole slide you're going to have one portion of L. And of course, because L is the whole length of the street, then the distance between I and F2 will be L minus X. Very simple. So I put this information into a chart just so that it's easier for you to see. So consumer I is based on all this information and F1 is going to, they're going to have the same willingness to pay because again, same price. And there's going to be no consumer preference based on that. Um, the price is going to be different that they're selling if they're changing it, but right now we're saying they're the same. They have the transportation cost. So as I said before, transportation will be the T and you multiply it by the number of miles, kilometers or distance that you have between the point and the place you want to be. Um, again, for F1, it would be X times T and then for F2 would be L minus X times T because it's whatever remainder you have. And so the equation we're going to look is at the consumer surplus. So R minus P1 plus TC. TC is not total cost here. It's TC is transportation times your marginal cost, your miles. Okay, it's just, I know TC looks confusing, but just think about it that they're totally different things and T stands for transportation cost. So um, we focus on P1 and P2, but by setting the consumer surplus of F1 equals to the consumer surplus of F2. So once you set them equal, you're going to simplify and solve for X. X will be Q1. So this is going to be the quantity that you're going to be selling, basically. Um, so X equals P2 minus P1 over 2T plus L over 2. So these are two different, you know, if you're looking at it this way, it kind of not makes that sense. But think about it, this is one, and then this is the next one. So it's not all divided by two, it's just one fraction minus the other fraction. Um, and sorry. And then um, knowing X, you can plug it into L minus X in order to find Q2. And again, here Q2 is going to be P1 minus P2 over 2T plus L over 2. Um, and then we're going to focus on trying to find the profits. So the profit of one is going to be equal to the price of one minus the marginal cost times the quantity of one. Again, Q1, we know it's equal to X. And you're going to do the same thing for um, profit two. It's going to be P2 minus marginal cost times quantity two, which would be L minus X. You can plug in the formula for Q1 and Q2 here in or and as well as the constants because you will be given R and you will be given L and you will be given T. So you're going to be actual numbers. This is just a formula. So don't think when you're trying to solve it, you're going to have a lot of unknowns. Right now we're trying to simplify it. So you only have one thing to find. Um, and as I said before, X is equal to Q1. So you're just going to plug in this formula into Q1 in order to find it. Now, we use the profit to find the prices because we can use the marginal profit setting it equal to zero. We're using partial derivatives at this point um, in order to find P1 and P2. So once you do those steps, you're going to find that P1 is equal to P2 plus LT plus M um, times MC over two. MC is just because it's marginal cost. Um, and it uses P1 to find P2. So you know P2 is equal to LT plus C. This is just a simplified version, right? Of course, there's like a lot of many steps between this and this, but basically once you plug back in and you do all of the math, you get that result. And then again, you use a P tool to plug into P1 and find it. So in the end, we find that in equilibrium, P1 equals P2, and that's going to be equal to the length of the street times the transportation plus the marginal cost. So that's the formula you need to remember in the end. This is in equilibrium. Um, and the difference between minimum product differentiation and maximum in terms of prices is that in the maximum, they would actually make a profit, even though they're still the same distance apart from each other with the same market share. Is everybody clear? No questions? Amazing.
Okay, so consumer preference on location. This is kind of to close back on what we just saw on the minimum versus the maximum. Um, so we have a preference on dispersion, right? The longer the street, the longer the consumer preference is dispersed because you're going to have more options along the way, right? So if the length doubles, but the amount of consumers stays the same, there is more preference difference due to the transportation cost. Because if before you were, if before I was here and I have no preference, but then the doors double the space, well, then it's going to be a longer distance. And I might think, do I actually want to leave the room and go to that door? <laughs> So then um, some of the restaurants or the, or the firms might have to take that into consideration and adapt their price according to the transportation costs in order to make these changes um, indifferent to the client. So um, the transportation cost increases as well since there's more distance to travel. So as I said before, F1 and F2 need to take this into account and they might just adjust their prices to make the consumer indifferent due to the increase in transportation costs. And just if you remember, L is going to be the spread of the preference and T is going to be equal to the intensity of the preference. Because, yes? No, no, no I'm just scratching my Sorry. Um, so, yeah, so as, as T increases, it becomes harder and harder to change the preference. But if T is equal to zero, then that means you have no limitations to where or how far you can go. And you have no more product differentiation for location because that's what happens when both of the firms are in the same place and the consumers in the same place. Well, there's going to be no preference coming to it. There's going to be no intensity of where should I go because it doesn't make a map up, like it doesn't change anything. We take one step to the right or one step to the left, you know, so we don't want transportation costs to be equal to zero because then we lose all of our differentiation based on location. Um, so just a little note again, hotelings model is not just for location. It can be used to explore other attributes of consumer preference for product differentiation, but CES want to understand because we're using distance and it's just it makes more sense in order to grasp the, um, the concept. Now, moving on to a next topic, which is transaction cost. So in neoclassical economics, we have seen two functions, production and consumption. But there's a third one that refers to it as um, transaction, it's, as a transaction itself, right? So transaction cost is kind of be related to, yes, you have your demand, you have your consumer, but how are you actually going to make the exchange between this demand and this supply, right? So that's where the transaction kind of come in. And there's a lot of costs associated with that transaction, which before we wouldn't even take into consideration. So there's three different kind of ways and methodologies to approach this. The first one is wall ration auctioning. So here economists suppose that there is someone like a god or someone that sees everything in the market who knows everybody's willingness to pay and everybody's willingness to supply. And so that way, that person that knows everything will be able to coordinate buyers and sellers in the market as well as the equilibrium price because if you see it all you know it all you can move them around and know what's going to change right if you're playing chess and you're seeing it from the top you know how to move your little pawns which if you're just the little pawns well you might not know where you're going to go um then we have the bilateral search but in the bilateral search there are many transaction costs associated so here buyers and sellers trade with each other directly However, buyers and sellers group their respective willingness to pay and willingness to supply, thereby executing market transactions by themselves. Buyers and sellers are going to search and bargain for it because I'm not going to know how much you're willing to offer, how much I'm willing to pay. So because nobody knows each other, I think it's just going to kind of be like a bargain negotiation trying to figure out and it's going to go on and on until you both reach that kind of point in equilibrium where you're both happy, right? Like I'll be happy selling you a computer for a thousand, I don't know. But you would only buy it for nine for nine hundred. Well, you're not really gonna know the prices until you kind of bargain and you reach that point where you would both be satisfied with this question, which again would be the price and quantity at equilibrium because that's what we've seen before and that's what makes sense to us. Um, but still, this would be time consuming and there's lots of costs associated with it. And also, as we know, time is money, so you don't want to waste your time trying to buy something. So that's why we see the third model coming into place, which would be intermediation right here. So. Buyers and sellers trade with intermediaries. Intermediaries, you know, it's kind of like the middleman that's going to facilitate a trade, an interaction, or anything happening. Um, buyers and sellers trade with the intermediary, and the intermediary basically will buy the good from the seller at the bid price, B, because it's a bid, and then they're going to sell it to the buyers at the ask price, A. So that's why we have the buy ask model, right? So the bid ask spread of the intermediary's profit is going to be the ask price minus the bid price. So how much he's getting in money versus how much he paid. Of course, the ask price is always going to be higher than the bid price because why would you buy something for more expensive and then sell it for cheaper? You would be making a loss. And again, we don't like making losses. We like winning. We like making money. Okay. 
So um, they buy at a specific price from the seller and then resell it at a higher price to the consumer. But in the market, both the bid and ask prices are available. So then sellers and buyers can see this and try to use that to trade directly. But why wouldn't they just do directly and cut the middleman? Well, they still need to negotiate the price and that's time consuming. So that's why they use intermediaries as transactions can happen immediately, right? Why intermediaries emerged is that as transaction costs are not equal to zero, they provide immediacy. Time is money, so again, people are not gonna wanna have to go the hassle to negotiate to find the prices where someone else can just buy it and sell it for you and you can just go buy it, bada boom, no time wasted, no effort put, right? So that's kind of where the intermediaries come into place. So now, this is a graph that we all saw in class and it's kind of using it in order to figure out, um, to understand the better role of each player, right? So for using the intermediary, whenever you're selling a product for the transaction cost. So this would be like your transaction cost graph that we're looking at. So the demand and supply curves are based on this, right? So demand would, would be equal to negative P plus one and your supply is equal to P. Setting equal to each other, you're gonna find that P zero is equal to one half and Q zero is equal to one half. That would be the price and quantity in equilibrium. Zero is always gonna be in equilibrium. Um, but now the intermediaries will set the ask price and a bid price B. So here you're gonna have the A and then B, right? Again, ask price is always gonna be higher because you're gonna sell it for a higher profit than you bought it. Um, the number of intermediary transactions is determined by the minimum of QS or QB. Um, in this case, it would be QS as it's less than QB. And so that would be your section that you're gonna look at. For each transaction, we have a profit function. So profit is equal to A minus B times the minimum of QS and QB. So in this case, for this function, the profit would be A minus B times QS. Now, in order for this to work better, you need to look into this concept called matching probability, which this can indicate the search cost. We remember before we had another concept called bilateral search. Well, the search cost is kind of relating if people are gonna have competitors or not. So you can either have um, your match price equal to zero or one. So if you just first look at the um, the graph, you're gonna think that even though the square shows that it would be between zero and one half, in reality, still between zero and one because you have all of this other space that's unexplored that you're not taking into account. So, and thus, if you're the buyer, it means that you have 100% of meeting your buyer and vice versa. Even if matching probability is 100, there's no guarantee that a transaction would take place because of negotiations. So regardless if the matching price is still 100, you will still use intermediaries. Now, putting this better into concept, matching probability is zero. No search markets, just you, no competition. So here we're gonna find A and B, such that these prices maximize the profit for the intermediary. In this case, QS is smaller than QB. So the profit formula, as I said before, is gonna be A minus B times QS. There's another case in which the profit is maximized other than this formula. And that's what we're gonna look here when we look into the profit function to find all those um, numbers. So the precondition you have to take into consideration is that the prices A and B must be equal in quantity. So QB equals QS, and then there's no difference, right? So when that's not the case, we can raise prices to increase profit without changing the number of intermediate transactions. Now, because we made QS equals to QB, we can take it out and that's why we only have Q, right? Because QS, QB equals the same thing. So let's just put Q and get the letters throughout the way. Now, in order to find the values, we plug A and B into the demand and supply functions. A goes into D, um, which would be Q equals minus A plus one, and B goes into S, Q equals B. We rearrange and plug into the profit function. So in the end, your profit's gonna be equal to negative two Q squared plus Q. And then in order to maximize it, you have to find the marginal profit. Um, so in this case, it would be negative four Q plus one equals zero. So once you solve it out, you're gonna find that Q is equal to one fourth. And that's what we have right here, right here. Um, so yeah, and then once you find your Q, you can use this in order to find your A and B. So in the end, you're just gonna plug it back into the formulas because you're already gonna know them. Um, so yeah, in the end, A is gonna be equal to three fourths and B is gonna be equal to one fourth. And so when you plug it into your profit again, once you know all of the numbers, you're gonna know that your profit is gonna be equal to one A. Again, the orange rectangle is gonna be your profit area. Now, it gets a little bit more complicated whenever you're doing matching probability equal to one. This means you're also taking into account the search market. So there's competitors when matching probability is equal to one. Because of this, we will both we will take into consideration both consumer surplus and producer surplus. So first looking at the buyer side, consumer surplus. 
as long as the consumer surplus for the buyers um, get from bilateral search is greater than the consumer surplus from intermediaries, the buyers will continue to search. Um, but if the consumer surplus from search is less than the consumer surplus from intermediaries, then the intermediaries can retain buyers and maximize their profit. Thus, intermediaries will focus on setting the consumer surplus for them equal to the consumer surplus of the search. Um, and then we all know that the consumer surplus of the search is going to be equal to the remaining consumer surplus in the market right here, because of course it's the area next to the profit rectangle we had before minus the producer surplus. So it's going to be this blue little triangle here. Um, once you know that you said um, CSS equal to one half times, sorry, times one half minus one half times A minus one half, and then you're going in the end, you're going to get one half times one half times A minus one half. And then you're going to find your um, consumer surplus for the intermediaries, which would be for M. And that's going to be one fourth times A minus A prime. So again, in order to change this, we're going to have A and A prime right here, right? So that's going to be the change in price you're doing in order to better adapt to fit with the new competition being added into your market. Um, then you're going to set them equal and simplify. So in order to make buyers indifferent, you know that you're going to have your A prime be equal to three fourths minus one eighth equal the percentage, right? So then you're going to know that your new A it was three fourths and your new A prime is going to be five eighths. It's kind of going to go in half of what it used to be between the um, equilibrium point and your maximum. But so, yeah, there's a lot of functions in between. Again, I just kind of put the last points. So it would be easier to comprehend. So we all know that A prime is in the end going to have to be fifth eighths. Now, if you're looking at the suppliers, then it's a similar thing, except we're looking at the producer surplus instead of the consumer surplus. But it's the same thought process, same methodology we're doing, right? So in order to have a profit maximization, we must set the producer surplus of the search equal to the producer surplus of the M, right? Of your intermediary. Um, and here we have the equation that you would want to do. Then you plug in B and you're going to find that um, one fourth times B prime minus one fourth is going to be equal. So once you simplify it and cancel out one of the one fourths, these are the two equations setting it equal to each other. Um, you're going to find that B prime is equal to three eighths right here. Okay. Um, having done this, we have the new bid and ask prices that will maximize profit regardless of the bilateral search. So then this is going to be our new profit. Now it's going to be one over 16. So we can see that by adding the search engine, your profit reduced by 50%. Um, the new spread now is going to be A prime minus B prime, and it's going to be one fourth. And yeah, so now your new profit is going to be the little purple area, and you're going to have consumer purchase service because it's not maximized now, as there's more people in the market. Now, moving on to the last chapter, two-sided market and price structures. Almost there. So first, I need to take into consideration in order to differentiate the two-sided market is what is a traditional market? Well, you can also see them as a dichotomy. Um, the dichotomy, that's also the same thing as a traditional market, where it's between buyers and sellers or producers and consumers. The pretty average thing, right? But here what defines a two-sided market, it's the differences from the traditional, right? So here we're going to look at a platform and users. So the difference is that now we have three economic agents. So you're going to have user side one, user side two, and then the platform. So we're going to have three agents instead of two. So that's why it's called the two sided market instead of the traditional one. Um, we also have to take into consideration any network effects. Now here network effects, I'm not referring to the ones we saw way back about the snob effect, the Veblen. This is kind of like a different network effect we're looking at. So try not to get it um, that confused. Um, so it's very important to remember that side one and two are interdependent due to two positive cross side networks. So the example that we have here is with Uber, right? So let's say on side one, you have the riders, the people that are trying to get a ride from Uber. You have the platform, which would be kind of the intermediary. And then you have the side two, which would be the drivers. Now, both of the users have a demand, right? Because the drivers want to drive people to make money and the riders want to get people to drive them around and pay money. But it's still two demand sides instead of a demand and a supply. So that's why it's different from the traditional markets, because here we have two demands, two side markets. Um, and so we have the cross side network effect from riders to drivers and from drivers to riders, which means that it's kind of like going in a, in a circle, right? The more demand for riders, the more demand for drivers, the more demand for drivers. And it kind of goes like 
back and forth in a circle, right? So here, Uber serves as a link to the two sides of the users, the two-sided marketing. Now, the cross-site network effect, as I said before, it happens on opposite sides, and it occurs when the consumer base increases and more people demand the product. So the demand for um, the other side increases also as both sides use the product and it kind of just goes on and on. Now, we have to look into a pricing strategy for two-sided market because the way you're going to price your products is going to be very different than if you would regular um, markets, right? Because then you're going to have two demands instead of one. So here's the example that teacher used, and I think it's very fitting for the class. It would be the Adobe PDF. So basically, there are two sides to the market here, and there were two different demands. Now, um, in case you guys didn't remember from the lecture, um, when Adobe first opened up in like 18, 1980s or the 1990s, um, they set the same price structure as they would a monopoly or a normal market. So they gave one price for D1 and one price for D2, right? So in Adobe, there's the two different sides and like the two different demands would be from the readers and from the writers. So the readers is any person that can have access to the files in order to read them, get more information, get more knowledge. And then the writers would be that other side in which you would be able to write and share your stories. But they would charge subscriptions to both sides. So people have to pay in order to read what the other people were writing and the people had to pay in order to write. So needless to say, it was an epic fail. The pricing strategy did not work because no one had to pay the price. And so there was no, you know, they didn't take into consideration this little concept we saw before called the cross and network effects. And they kind of forgot that the two demands are interdependent. They depend on each other. Not You cannot view them as separate things. You cannot say demand one is ice cream and then demand two is orange. It's like they are related, you know, they kind of go hand in hand. So it's very important to take that into consideration when you're setting the pricing strategy for a two-sided market. So um, as I said before, we have to assume that the demand is linear and the um, marginal cost will be equal to zero. So in the 1900s, the change to a monopoly price, looking at the marginal revenue compared to the demand for both sides. This wasn't successful after the two sides are interdependent because the demands are related. The, doc the more documents and PDF, the more readers will join. The more readers using PDF, the more writers will want to use their platforms to show their work. So we see the positive cross-site network effect, which was not taken into consideration by Adobe. When their fancy was the 1990s, so they maybe didn't take this concept into account. But then they came back strong, because in the 2000s, they relaunched it and they changed their pricing strategy, in which they decreased um, the price for the readers to zero. It was free. If you wanted to just read a PDF on Adobe, it was free. You didn't have to pay any money. So they changed the price. But um, they came free, but they increased the demand for the writer's version, right? So then they're going to raise the prices for the writer. So before, let's say you had to pay 70 and now you pay 200 in order to be able to write. But seeing that the people could read for free, then there were a lot of people on the platform wanting to read. And writers wanting to get noticed would think this is a good investment. So they would pay the higher subscription because it was worth it for them. And then, of course, the more writers, the more people wanted to join to read their work. And it's kind of like the cyclical effect, as per before, that positive um, network um, effect that they had. So they were able to increase the price thanks to the increase in demand as to maximize their profits. As it was a success, Adobe kept this pricing strategy and it's still the same one they use today. So it's like a very effective thing if you're trying to think how you're going to price a two sided market. I think one on one, you have to make it very attractive so people come. So you have a lot of like traction and people coming in, a lot of traffic in your website. And then people are going to want to put advertisements, want to sell more, invest. So that way you can still make a profit, but you're taking into advantage that the two demands are interdependent and they work together. Um, but yeah, so compared to the previous pricing strategy, now P1 was equal to zero and P2 was, um, was better than the previous one they had. The mistake in the previous um, pricing strategy is that both demands were treated as if they were independent. These are just some final lines of thoughts to consider pr um, pricing strategy. So some things to consider the subsidy side and the money side. So subsidy side is going to be um, the one not being charged for using the platform, right? Whoever's being subsidized so you don't have to pay. You know, whenever a government gives someone a subsidy, it means they're giving them help so they don't actually have to spend money, right? So kind of like associated with that subsidy side is going to be the side that's kind of using it for free, just getting the motion going. And then the money side is the one that they're going to have to pay for the platform and that they're going to be the ones putting in the money in order to make it profitable. Um, so, for example, using Adobe, um, the readers would be the subsidies and then the writers would be the money side. Now, other things to take into consideration wherever you're doing a pricing strategy, um, it's also thinking about the users and the industries. So basically, you have the chicken and egg problem, right? Like which comes first? 
which side should be attracted first? Should we focus first on the subsidy side or first on the money side? Like who's going to start that? Who's going to get the ball rolling? Who's going to get it going, right? Then you also have to take into consideration how you're going to attract both sides. Um, how many users are needed to kick up the network effects? The network effects are kind of like a snowfall rolling downhill. You know, it increases as more people joining. So you kind of have to think, how are you going to get it go going? How are you going to attract people? Who's going to um, get it started? How are you going to avoid any negative network effects? And then there's also the winner takes all effect. Now, this effect is, means that as long as the, the platform can amass thousands of millions of bajillions of users, um, it's hard for competitors to challenge that platform because it's already very well established. No competitors can come because they already have a thousands of users coming. Let's say if there's a new version of Instagram coming out. Who's going to switch from Instagram to this new version? Okay, better example. TikTok and Triller, right? Everybody uses TikTok. Nobody uses Triller. They're trying to compete with a platform that already has thousands and thousands of competitors. So it's kind of like the winner takes it all, right? So you're either going to use this or the other. So it's kind of like that concept. I don't know if you guys like use TikTok, but I figure that people will know about it. <laughs> um, so yes, that's kind of like the winner takes it all. As long as you can have a like a relative competitive advantage to your competitors, then you should be good to go. And then if you're looking about the industries, the products and the cost, you need to take into consideration in which industry the platform intends to operate, as well as the, the pricing and the marginal cost. And then lastly, last slide, and you should be ready for the exam, of course, unless you have any questions. And after you see the case studies, um, these are some concepts that are related to the two-sided market, but are fundamentally different, right? So first we have complements. People might think that complements could be related to two-sided marketing. However, complements involve two or more products that go together and they're used by one group of consumers. So it's only going to be one demand. It's going to be one side. Then you have price discrimination. Okay, specifically the third degree, right? As prices are different, but it's not for the same case as the prices are different for the same product, right? You're not going to say like, okay, yes, but the prices for demand one for the subsidy side are different than the prices for the money side. But yeah, but they're not different because they're trying to make more profit. It's just how they work because they're interdependent. So they're kind of related, but they're different in the sense that, you know, you're, you're looking at one, you're looking at two different prices for the same product. And the other one, you're looking at two demands, like two phases of the same product. So it's like a different concept. Um, and then you have product differentiation. Here, there's no product differentiation, like even though it involves a consumer preference, because one might want to be the reader instead of the writer. So there's going to be a preference, there's going to be a differentiation but it's not changing the product, you know, it's just which use you're going to give to that same product. Because, you know, Adobe PDF is still the same thing, buy and read networks. Now you can choose which side you want to be on. So it's not the same thing as product differentiation. And then finally, we have intermediation, which is, yes, the platform serves as a link, which can be an intermediary. However, here there's no reselling aspect, right? The platform's not buying from one and then selling it to the other. It's just kind of working there, floating, chilling, and then it's connecting the two demands that are coming together. So again, um, there's merely a link between the demands that coexist. So yeah, those are basically the recap of theory. If you have any questions after the case studies, I'll be happy to help you out. And I hope this was helpful and sorry that it took so long, but it was like nine chapters. So uh, first case study, uh, it's basically a very simple one, Uber search, pricing and market efficiency. Uh, so what is it all about? Um, so it's about Uber and US uh, taxi company. Um, so they increase the prices when the de when demand increases. So why do they do so? They increase prices with purpose of increasing the supply. So if they don't increase prices, the supply stays the same, but demand is much higher. So uh, the company is not efficient, right? Because they can only do as many rides as there are taxi drivers or Uber drivers, right? So that's why. So first of all, what happens first? What happens first is that demand curve will move to the right. That uh, occurs, for instance, after concerts, after big sport events. Uh, everyone wants to get home, right? So everyone uh, opens the Uber app. Uh, and they want to order a ride. And that's why demand shifts to the right. So if we just leave it like this and we don't increase prices, what's going to happen is that although we have a theoretical equilibrium here, but uh, theory is one thing, but you know, in practice, it happens uh, even in theory, it looks great now. So they can charge more uh, for, for and they can do higher quantity. But if they don't have enough cars, 
uh, then you can study the theory the entire day, but if you don't have enough cars, then you just won't make it, right? Uh, so that's why they have to increase the price um, to attract more uh, more drivers, right? To join uh, the certain area. That's why uh, surging always uh, is just limited to one area where demand is increased, right? Uh, it uh, basically if if search uh, pricing works, uh, then we have a new equilibrium and we will be able to, to do 100% of uh, drive requests. So we will be able to uh, actually serve all customers. Uh, otherwise, if it fails, we have it leads to market inefficiency because then our rate of successful dry, uh, successfully processed requests will be around only 20 to 30 percent right so only 20 percent of rights will be completed first of all customers won't be happy second of all we are losing revenue uh, so that's why we will, the system will automatically recognize the higher demand and it will increase the prices so the supply and demand will meet again um, so normal rate is now the market price and it's very similar to price ceiling when the search pricing fails, right? Uh, so when search pricing fails, why is it price ceiling? Because we, the, if the app doesn't recognize it correctly, like it happened in this case, then uh, everyone will want to ride, and, uh, but the app will not charge more than it would normally. So the Uber just won't have enough vehicles to serve all people. Um, so when it fails, we also have a uh, dead weight loss. So we we'll, we have the welfare uh, is not maximized, right? Uh, so also when we have uh, the search, when we uh, analyze the welfare, so uh, search creates that weight loss. That will always happen. It just depends uh, what, how large is a consumer and how much is a producer surplus, right? And then the, the third triangle, the one here, will be uh, the dead weight loss. So if you have to calculate it, it's just uh, the, the little triangle. Um, so Uber, what Uber does, they simply reflect the new market market equilibrium. They will just rise re rise the prices to meet the to meet the demand. Uh, the second case study, it's also a very intuitive one because uh, in like very simply what happened. Uh, so we will analyze three types of wine. We will analyze the Pinot Noir, which was um, which appeared in the movie Sideways. Uh, we will analyze the other one, Merlot. Uh, the guy in the movie actually had a preference for Pinot Noir. And then we will also compare it to uh, to the third wine, um, to uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, which wasn't featured in the movie. So Cabernet Sauvignon will be our uh, our control group. So um, yeah, so it was just the sideways effect. It's named after American movie Sideways, which was featured in 2004. Uh, so origin of sideway effect is that the movie uh, was a big uh, success. So a lot of people saw the movie and actually because the Miles Raymond uh, was actually a large, very large fan of Pinot Noir, uh, that actually mirrored on the on wine market. So uh, demand for Pinot Noir increased. So, uh, so our control group will be Cabernet Sauvignon, right? Uh, why did we choose so? Because it's red wine, very similar to Pinot Noir and Merlot. Um, and we will see that demand for Cabernet Sauvignon wasn't affected by sideway effect because sideway effect only affected two wines featured in the movie. Um, how do we identify sideway effect? We compared patterns, patterns of all two wines before the release of the movie and after. Um, we will also compare it for different price ranges. We will see that for cheaper wines, actually sideway effect was larger than for ex more expensive ones. It's very simple because people buying more expensive wine, they have a very particular taste and they this taste won't be so affected by the movie, right? As the taste of just a regular client who will see, okay, Pinot Noir, okay, the guy likes it. I want to try it myself if it's really that good, right? Uh, that's why the demand rises. But we will also see that this rising demand is time uh, is time limited, right? So that's what happened. That That's where the movie came out. So we can see that right after the movie uh, came out, the demand for uh, Pinot, Pinot Noir actually rose a lot in, in one year. 
um, and the demand for Merlot uh, actually fall uh, quite a lot because we have a certain quantity of wine that is sold uh, in wine market. So uh, then uh, we can see that uh, Cabernet Sauvignon was not affected by the move. Um, and okay, if we decompose the price and sideways effect, uh, so if we assess the, the change in quantity of Pinot Noir and Merlot, right, if price doesn't change, so if we keep the same price, uh, then Pinot Noir uh, quantity will increase and the Merlot price will decrease. Why? Because Merlot uh, producers, they will want to still sell the wine. So if they uh, if they keep the same, if they so if they first of all if they keep the same price, they will say less wine, right? So we will see in a second case if quantity doesn't change. If Merlot producer want to sell exactly the same quantity, they will have to decrease the price. But on the other hand, because Pinot Noir fans now want to buy more Pinot Noir, but producers can't change the supply in short period of time, right? So if they want to 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 to, uh, to reach the demand level, the new equilibrium, the only way is to raise the price of Pinot Noir. But if we ca if they we can change both quantity and the price, uh, then the price and quantity of Pinot Noir will increase, and for Merlot, both will decrease. Um, then the price for Cabernet Sauvignon increases. Why? Just because of the pure price effect, right? And the quantity will decrease. So consumer knowledge, as we said, for very expensive wines, the side effect will affect market less than for cheap wines. Um, and that that's basically well, what mostly what you need to know about the, this case study. Um, then the case study three is about Airbnb versus hotels in supply adjustment. Um, so what's all this study all about? Uh, simply, uh, if we do a very simple recap without these fancy graphs, it's about uh, occupancy and ADR of hotels versus occupancy and ADR of Airbnb. So the difference is, is as you know, for the Airbnb, uh, you don't need to build a special facility. You don't need to 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 invest in a building. You can just uh, rent out your own apartment, right, during the high season. So the sellers, so the owners of the apartments for Airbnb, they can control the time that they their their uh, accommodation is available, right? So during the high season, more accommodations will be available than during the low season, and that's why the Airbnb can adjust their supply. But hotels, on the other hand, they, you have labor, investment, and land. So this the, the investment, and then you have capital. And that's from microeconomics, we know that when we have these three factors, we cannot change quantity in, in short terms, right? Because if we want to increase quantity there, we will have to make a larger investment. And then what happens? Okay, during the summer, we will, we will be able to uh, welcome more customers, but during the low uh, occupancy months, we will have even lower occupancy. That's why hotels, they have much more fixed, um, they have really fixed uh, uh, supply. Uh, so we can see here, first one, it's the average ADR, which we can see that for hotels, it's it fluctuates a lot. So we can see that in summer, uh, the, the ADR is almost uh, twice, uh, as, twice as, as high as during uh, winter months, but for the for the Airbnb, it barely changes. And it's the same for the occupancy. Uh, the the uh, the graph for Airbnb it's almost linear. Why? Because as we said, they can change the supply, and hotels can't change the supply. So on, for only way for the only way for hotels to reach the new equilibrium is by changing the price, and that's why the ADR fluctuates a lot. Um, so in the hotel industry, uh, it just the supplier affects fixed cost, and this fixed cost can only be uh, altered through the entry of new hotels uh, in the long run. They can't be changed in the long, long in the short run. As, as we said before, due to mac microeconomics reason, hotel supply is fixed in short run, um, and the for the Airbnb cost. Uh, room numbers is also fixed because let's assume that we don't get more hosts, right? In one year, we will have the same amount of hosts, although in reality, that may be a totally different story. Um, 
but the cost can alter the number of available days. So the hosts can place with supply, right? So in summer, they make more days available than during winter, for instance. Um, and uh, that's what you need to know about it. Um, then just demand versus supply. Uh, I think that we that's what we actually said, it's just a bit more in more complicated way. But the most important is to remember hotel cannot change its capacity nor available days because if hotel wants to make money, they will make all rooms available all year round. They will make some renovations during winter, but still that won't really increase, decrease the number of rooms. Uh, but Airbnb um, supply equals room numbers, which in short, short run, they doesn't change either. But in short run, Airbnb can change uh, <coughs> the, the time that rooms are available for sale. <coughs> so remarks on competition. Uh, so this segment is very competitive. Uh, and this is actually the Airbnb claims that they will increase the uh, the, the they will increase the ADR and occupancy of the hotels in the, the city where they operate because of billboard effect basically. So if someone will see the advertisement, they will see a good deal on on Airbnb for a certain city, but then they won't find the accommodation that fits them. They will go to the hotel, right? So that's why in their study, Airbnb claims to also help the local to be helping local hotels uh, with by increasing their occupancy. Um, so they claim that they are beneficiary for the whole lodging industry, which on the other hand, hotels disagree, but um, yeah, just remember that they claim to do so. Um, so the present of Airbnb, of course, it decreases hotel demand uh, and they, it drives down the ADR and occupancy, uh, but on the other hand, true to billboard effect, it increases it. Uh, so it the market is usually then, uh, it stays the same, right? It increases and decreases it for approximately the same uh, values. Uh, so then we have um, our fourth case study, was the first one that we did after the, the midterm, and it was the Starbucks case study. So uh, everything is based on the Starbucks menu, right? So Starbucks has three sizes for most of the drinks. Uh, we have tall, which is uh, kind of small. It's not really small. It's the U.S. small, which means it's still big. Uh, <laughs> then we have grande, which is medium, but as already, if you speak Italian, that doesn't really sound medium. Uh, and then we have venti, because they couldn't really invent uh, the word for, for large, large. So they invented venti, which is the, the largest size they have. Um, there's Trenta. Trenta. Yeah, Trenta. Trenta, okay, but uh, here we here we assume that we don't have Trenta. Uh, something new for me as well. I didn't really go to Starbucks a lot. Um, so we want to know the core of this case study. If we just uh, say it with our own words once again and don't use the complicated graphs and everything. So the core of this case study is to figure out which size is the most profitable for Starbucks, right? Because you always have two types. You have fixed cost that will be the same for each type of drink, and you have a marginal cost, right? Uh, in this case, we will mostly focus on marginal cost, and we will assume that the marginal cost, uh, we will um, look at the volume. So the volume of each drink, so I think it's 12 ounce, uh, 16 ounce, and 20 ounce, uh, so 12 ounce for tall, 16 for grand, and 20 for 20. So we will divide the total price of a drink by its quantity to see uh, a price per ounce. Uh, and then we will compare it to the cost and we will try to figure out if Starbucks only served one size, which one would be the most profitable for them? Which we already can assume which one, right? Medium, any other Many. guesses? And the tall. Oh, so we have three different answers, huh? <laughs> uh, yes, the, the, the actually answer is tall, right? The smallest one. Why? Because they will earn the most in in the smallest one. Their marginal revenue for the smallest one will be the will be the highest because uh, the if we look at the the quantities here, you can see that the size of venti is almost twice as large. It's almost twice as large as tall, right? 
but the price, look at the price. The price for the small one is 305 and the price for the Venti is 420. So even with very uh, simple analysis, you can already figure out that they make much more money per ounce for toll that they make for Venti. And there is also another advantage for Venti, uh, for toll you will get a smaller amount, so you'll maybe buy two or three, so that would make them earn even more money. So you have two reasons why if Starbucks only decided to serve one quantity, they would go for toll. Um, so, um, yeah, we'll just, as I said, we took volume in ounces, we divided by price and we we can hear we have a price, a limit price, right? How much do they earn for one ounce? So we can see that for toll, it's very, it's the most profitable. They earn 25 cents per ounce. But for, for Grande, this number is not 25 uh, anymore. It's just 23. And for Vanny, it goes even down for, they only get 20 cents per ounce. So we can build a graph here with the linear function of uh, demand, so of inverse demand function. And we can see actually that for the first one, where they will earn 2.25.4 uh, cents per ounce, they will have the highest surplus, right? So the, they will be most happy in first case. So that is uh, basically graphical representation of the reason why they would only serve toll if they had to decide for one size. Uh, so if the, the, the second question, so I went here question by question. So the second question of the case study was actually to calculate demand, uh, inverse demand function uh, and marginal revenue function. So what do we do here? So uh, first of all, uh, inverse demand function is the one that we saw here. And it's not really about the hospitality economics. It's more about the math. So how do we get it? We choose two points, right? X and Y. We have an equation of linear function. And then we have to calculate the coefficient. When we calculate the coefficient, we will just plug uh, another point into the into the equation, and we should get the equation of um, inverse demand function. Why is it inverse demand function? Because we wanted to express it in terms of price here, right? So if if it was a regular demand function, we would express it in terms of quantity. That's intuitive way of expressing it because or uh, Q is what we have on, on the X axis, right? And we have price on Y axis. Um, so, um, and how to get marginal revenue? Uh, so as you know, marginal revenue is derivative of total revenue. How do we get total revenue? From microeconomics, uh, I hope you still remember total revenue is price times quantity. We have the equation for price here. So we only multiply it by quantity. We multiply each and every part of the equation by quantity. We get A times Q squared plus 6Q, no, plus BQ, sorry. Um, something worked for me, yeah. If we have this inverse uh, demand function, should we not uh, make it so that that function, because that, sorry, the marginal revenue function, so the demand function, but times the two for the, the slope. Should we not make that equal to the marginal cost to then find the optimum quantity? And therefore, then after that, you can find the optimum price. Uh, but um, so we have marginal revenue, but we don't have marginal costs really in this. Uh, so you never have it in the case study. You don't really have marginal costs. No, it's it's a bit different because this. What? Why do we have the the, the idea of building the inverse demand function is to be able to find their uh, their revenue per ounce for each quantity. That's the idea, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So if they, for instance, if they they could ask you. Maybe what would what would be their revenue per ounce if they introduced the Trenta, so 25 ounces drink, right? 24. 24. Mm -hmm. So that's the question that could be asked for this type. So then you you would just have to plug uh, mm -hmm. the 24 ounces in this equation. You would yeah. get their cost per their revenue per ounce. But of course, yeah, if you had, if they gave you, so what would be the quantity optimizing the the revenue, and they gave you marginal cost as well. But here we we don't even focus on costs, right? We only have their their price, so we can calculate revenue. That would be very interesting to to do so. But always they will maximize their revenue here. We can already tell because we can see that here 
for the smaller the drink, the higher the revenue per, right. per ounce. So we can also assume that for smaller drinks, they have smaller cost, right? Yep. So they will always earn the most with the smallest possible drink. Yep. Um, as we said, so most profitable size is tall. Uh, we can also calculate the, 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 um, the marginal, the revenue here, right? The, the price times quantity, the square will be the revenue. Oh yeah, we have marginal cost actually, which is five cents. Uh, so in the second part of case study, I think they introduce uh, the mar marginal costs, which are five cents per, per ounce, right? So we could go back actually and minus five ounce from here, and that would be their profit per ounce, right? But it wouldn't change much because their profit would still but you know because why they don't have probably they don't have fixed costs here because everything every cost they have in this exercise kind of they don't probably take labor into consideration so uh the size of a cup and drink it will both depend on size right because yeah. when you have larger drink also the 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 plastic cup will be more expensive so that's why they only introduce marginal costs here um so uh, then also important is because marginal cost is five, so whatever size they would make, they would have to be careful that always a marginal revenue for one more ounce would be higher than five cents, right? So if they make Trenta and they give you in the exam, they give you a price for Trenta and they ask you, would Trenta be profitable? You have to once again go back uh, and see, uh, compare it to, to the second largest size to Benny, right? So if we have four ounces more and the price marginal cost for each ounce is five cents so what would be the lowest price if we round up numbers to five cents what would be the lowest number that they should charge for trenta 0 0.051 or so their marginal cost for trenta so for 24 ounces would be 20 cents more right 31 ounces is a trenta 31? Yeah, a venti, a venti for ice drinks is 24. 31? <laughs> yeah, that's quite that's like the size of a bladder or something. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's assume we have a 24 ounces drink. In a trailer. Okay, and the marginal cost is 5 cents per ounce, okay? What would be the minimal price Starbucks would have to charge for it if we... Look at this prices. So for Vanny, it's make profit or not to make to profit? Minimal, we always assume to make profit. Five. So Five this is rounds. This is so we have four ounces more, right? We have four ounces more. Yeah. We agree on that. Yeah. So their additional cost will be 20 cents, right? But we yeah. always said in hospital economics that marginal revenue has to be higher than marginal cost, right? To uh, to make uh, money. So they would have to charge at least five cents more. So their minimum price for them to, to be willing to sell Trenta would be to be able to charge 25 cents more. So the price would be 4.45, right? 4.20 plus 25 cents, yeah, 4.45. Because if they charge 4.40, 4 then they have the same revenue or, zero, or the same profit that they would have for Vanny. And that's, of course, they won't, They don't want to sell a larger drink for the same profit that they would have for a smaller one. Any questions at the moment? Good. Then otherwise we will go to McDonald's. Um, case study, of course. Uh, so uh, McDonald's versus Burger King. Uh, in product differentiation, this case study is based on the concept that Celia uh, explained extremely well. So it's uh, the hoteling, the, the the street, always probably all many students, they just remember uh, the street. So uh, let's keep it like this. So the line uh, we have to imagine as a street. So uh, once again, simply what's the core of this case study? We have two dealers on the street. We have two dealers, they deal the same thing, they make food. But there is one large difference. So you can read all of these, but I'll try to explain it my way. So um, 
the, the difference between McDonald's and Burger King is in marginal cost, but also in marginal utility, right? So the marginal cost will be higher for Burger King. So that's already one advantage for McDonald's, but also the marginal utility will be higher for McDonald's. So customers prefer McDonald's over Burger King. But that simply means that if, if, if a Burger King positions itself in a place uh, where they could attract the same, theoretically attract same amount of customers at McDonald's, and McDonald's has the same marginal, the higher marginal utility than the customers that have the same transportation costs and the same uh, product cost of going to McDonald's or to Burger King, they will go to McDonald's because McDonald's gave them higher utility, right? Um, so, um, what does it mean in practically? So, uh, so as we said, marginal cost, marginal utility. Uh, what will be the equilibrium? So, if we just go back, um, McDonald's. In that case, McDonald's will always try to monopolize the market, right? So they would set prices lower than Burger King. Why? Because they can afford this, right? Because their marginal cost is lower than the Burger King's one. McDonald's will also pursue low product differentiation because at the lowest product differentiation, they will attract the more customer because they have higher utility, but also because they have lower prices. So with lower prices, do you remember still the street, the, the hoteling uh, theory? Uh, you also have to take transportation costs into consideration, right, Cecilia? Yeah. It's about, not just about the price of a product, it's about price of a product combined with the price of transportation cost. Uh, so, um, McDonald's will have a large advantage here. Um, so, the best location for Burger King due to asymmetry as is in the center, but the center is also the best for McDonald's. Um, so, in practice, even if Burger King could choose first and they would choose the center, uh, McDonald's would intentionally choose, they would, all, McDonald's would also go for center, right? They would go for the same location because they have lower prices. And then oh, McDonald's would attract much more customers than Burger King. So the, the center of the street, it wouldn't be the good location for Burger King. So already now explaining this, what do you think intuitively would be the best location for Burger King? Yeah, the street. Is it, uh, does it matter which one? I don't think it makes a difference. It's still 50 50. Exactly. So, Burger King would have to decide for either of the ends. Why? Because then they can attract at least the customer from their part. Because if this customer, they want to go to McDonald's, which will be in the center, they will have to pay transportation costs, right? And although McDonald's would offer. you include the transportation cost, you would still stay with Burger King because your total cost will be lower. So for instance, if you imagine now uh, having a Burger King here in Charlie Agobe and having McDonald's downtown in Lausanne, uh, okay, you prefer McDonald's, McDonald's is cheaper, but still, if you want to go down Lausanne, you have to pay for Metro or you have to pay for gasoline plus the parking space. So you have high transportation costs, right? So, but in practice, we have the equation for to calculate this. Um, um, yeah, first of all, before we look at the equation of calculating the best position, we'll just like to look at two scenarios. So first one will be if McDonald's chooses first. Uh, McDonald's will always go for the, uh, for the center, right? Because they have... Uh, they have, they will aim for minimum product differentiation, but the differentiation, but they will also aim for a central position in the street because if they can set themselves in the center, whatever Burger King will choose will be better for McDonald's because they have lower prices. They are in the center. They will really just, they will not leave a lot of space for Burger King because if they, if McDonald's shows first and they would position them there themselves here. What would it mean practically? Okay, so they have lower prices, transportation costs, but then Burger King can position themselves here and still get large part of the street, right? Uh, so they don't want to do that. Uh, that's why they prefer to be in a center because if they, if McDonald's chooses the center, 
Burger King will have to stick only to really the edge of the street, so they will they will capture less customer than they if they than they would if McDonald's chose any other position than the center. Uh, but if Burger King selects first, uh, they don't want to select the center, right? Because if Burger King selects selects for the center. If they select center, McDonald's will also select center, and then they will not be able to sell uh, enough product. So they will go for an end of the street, and they will also go for a maximum product differentiation. Why? Because they can't compete with McDonald's in prices, so they will try to create a different product, right? So uh, do you remember the other example? It, it's not just about the price, for instance. It could be also for sweetness level. That was the other example. Right. So if McDonald's goes for sweetness or low sweetness level, Burger King will want to attract all the customer with preference for high sweetness. That's why the Burger King will will set high sweetness just to capture as much of the as of the market as they can. Uh, so this is practically. Um, so this is actually the sweetness the sweetness case, right? So McDonald's would position uh, in the center of the street. But for Burger King, if we look at these equations, so we have 10 different, uh, 10 different, uh, th th this time uh, the street is actually not the distance, but it's the, the level of sweetness, right? We have 10 different levels of sweetness. So we can clearly see that if McDonald's position themselves in, at five, that's the best for them because that's minimum differentiation, right? Five is in the middle. So if they position themselves in five, Burger King will have to go for the extreme value to be able to compete with them. And then we can calculate using this simple formula, right? We can calculate uh, actually the cost of, of uh, if, if they go for 10 degrees, uh, then their cost will be 2.5, right? But McDonald's cost, including uh, the cost, the, the um, variable, variable cost, so transportation cost, which is 0 0.15 per level, will be 2.25. So then Burger King will be able to attract more customers because at the degree 10, their their cost will be lower than McDonald's. But for degree 9, their cost will be 2.5, right? So it will be a P1 plus 0 0.5 times 4 minus P2. So we can clearly see here uh, that they will have the same price. But what does it mean? We, we said before that McDonald's has higher utility. So they can't, Burger King can't compete with McDonald's if they set the, if they have the same cost, so they have the same prices. Uh, so the green nine wouldn't work for them either. Uh, but the green 9.5 would. Anything, we can see from this case that anything above nine, so 9.1, if it's possible already, uh, it's already good, but also don't for in the exam, please don't forget about the other side because this always works as a symmetry. So for Burger King, also position zero would work because then they would still be far enough taking this uh, transportation cost into consideration, 0 0.25, one to five per a level. So taking this into consideration, McDonald's would have to pay for five, uh, levels again, and that would make the cost of McDonald's higher than the ones of Burger King. Uh, so then the Burger King can, in this case, only choose anything below one or above nine. Otherwise, they won't be able to make any profit. Okay, um, I mean, after two hours and 10 minutes, that also concludes our um, presentation. Uh, so, do you have any uh, questions for Cecilia or for, for myself? Okay, well, I'll try to open uh, the group to group chat. Um, you are the goats. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia, as well. Thank you. I love being her <laughs> Thank you, Regi. Thank you. Really hoped it helped you guys for the exam. Yeah. Best wishes, best luck. You're going to do amazing. Positive advice always. 
Yeah, so that's the exercise that actually I explained to you, right? It has to be one level above the, the additional costs, right? So if, this, if additional costs are 20 cents, they have to set the price which is 25 cents higher. Because if they set the price that just covers the marginal cost, then they are not making any additional profit, then it doesn't make sense for them to even sell a larger size, right? But 25 cents is option. So which is the, the option? Then you have to choose the option, which is right. the lowest difference. So uh, in this case, in this case, the so the marginal cost is e, which is so marginal cost so is five cents per ounce right yeah. the price is 420 and they want to add four ounces right mm -hmm. so what happens so what is there if they would just go linearly the price would be uh 440 right mm -hmm. but before 440 they've just covered the price of additional drink so yeah. they didn't do anything so they have to set a price of at least 4.5 to make some additional profit on this case thank you everyone